place. Uh, we apologize for the time delay. Uh, I'm going to go straight to what I want to say here. Um, let me start with a little bit about myself. I teach computational physics and I've been teaching this over the years and I came to realize that I am actually working in a refinery. When we talk about refinery all over the world, people think about how you can turn the dark goods, often called crude oil, into the various uh, fraction, such as uh, premium, uh, premium motor spirit, uh, diesel, and the rest. But when we talk about refinery as an academician, I am talking about the university. And so I work in the ref refinery. I prefer to use that nomenclature so that my university, which is physics department, data state university, Abraka, can also be referred to as the human refinery Abraka. Then we have University of uh, Johannesburg. We can also refer to it as human resources Johannesburg. Now, having said that, um, in the beginning, all I wanted was to teach my computational physics courses using language that, of course, is general purpose, language that will enable the student easily t take skills beyond physics. Then multi-platform, which means tomorrow, wherever they find themselves, either in the industry or if they remain in the academia, they can fit in because of the various platforms. So I also want a situation where my students will have access to the programming language. In fact, I started with MATLAB, and after some time, uh, if you're in Africa here, you discover that the exchange rate of the dollar to many African currency, the difference is large. So it became difficult at some point for my students to be getting this uh, license uh, uh, software. So I decided to look for a free and easily accessible uh, programming language so that my students will be able to learn this key without paying for it. Then I want a situation where the programming language will have so many libraries. Because one problem we have where I teach computational physics or computational science and engineering is that the curricula of both physics in particular and science and the engineering, for instance, they are so tight, so compacted, that introducing new things is always difficult. This is a serious problem which we have. So I wanted a programming language which we have many libraries so that my student can figure out the appropriate library to use to solve the diverse problem they want to solve. Then I have pursued all these goals over the years and um, we have a number of publications and of course my PyCon thought. I was here in 2014 to give a talk on the Python then. I've been, I think I was also at California, that is to PyCon 2012 in the US and this year I was at uh, PyCon US 2019 where I give a talk at the Educational Summit. Now, all this you can find in the, the website that is there, which is known as uh, the PyCon Africa Computational Science and Engineering Tour Project. Our new goal now is talking about Python, but I will tell you my basic philosophy all along is the desire to ease the learner into programming and to give them the opportunity to develop a conceptual model of what a program is and what it does. To accomplish the above, learners must have understanding of the problem by seeing computation as a means to the solution and not as a solver of the problem. So why I say this, I have a fear because from years now, we supervise postgraduate students, we have eager beginners in physics, and one thing we observe is that there are a lot of software today for solving various algorithms, for solving different problems you know, in physics and science and engineering. These algorithms, they are implemented, many of them are implemented in Python. And what many students do, postgraduate, they want to take the software and use it to compute data. As far as I'm concerned, that is good. But if you just compute the data of the originator of that software, then what you are doing 
you are just following what that person is doing. And of course, by definition, we know whoever is following can never lead. If you want to really do well in research, in science and engineering, you must be able to look at the software before then you know the problem you want to solve. Even if the software you are using is not capable of solving all the problems you have, you should be able to modify that software. This is why Python is good, it's an open source, right? You should be able to modify that software and use it to solve the problem you want to solve. By so doing, you are now a leader in your research area. So, this is, of course, if you look at it, this is simply this philosophy of uh, Python. If you, you agree with me today, the Python community is growing. And the way Python is expanding and being used in diverse areas, it has gone beyond the dream and even the fantasy of Guido when he was developing Python. So having another thing I wanted to do was having more and more learners access computing devices. Uh, this, for those of us here, access to laptop, it's easy for us, so we won't even know that there are people who do not have access to laptops, even when they are interested in programming. I have met them as I move around, and so it's always a problem. Sometimes you organize a workshop, you see people come, they want to come, to, they use the computer lab there, but they don't have their own laptops. So I am always interested in exploring how to use computing devices that are cheap enough for the learner to go home and be able to practice with them. Now, if you look at what are the basic functionality of every computing system, you talk about the input, you talk about the output, the processing, and of course, what the storage. Now, the Android phone, which we all carry today, has these capabilities. Now, why will I be talking about Android phone? As I said, for people like some of us who are here, Android Fool. What can you do with programming with Android Fool? But what I'm saying, uh, to, uh, uh, there are two things I just mentioned now. One of them is that I am interested in reaching those underprivileged people who do not have access to laptops or any other computing device more than the handset. The good news here is that the Android phone, which are the smartphones, of course, they are growing, the distribution is growing. There are statistics, which you will find in my talk in the US, which shows that the distribution of the Android phone is growing in Africa here, for example. More and more people are having access to the Android phone. And the way the technology is going, we know with the miniaturization tendency of we the physicists, we know Android phones are going to be more powerful at some point. They have short memory, uh, short megabytes and all that for now, but that is just for the period. They are going to advance. So looking at the adv at, uh, Android phone, it has all this capability, handheld, computer, right, and phones, powerful onboard computing capability, capacious memory, relative large screen, and open operating system that encourage application development. Now, interestingly, Quite a number of programming languages are already, they already have in advancing versions in the Android phone. For example, QPython, which is the Python version of the Android phone, has already been launched since 2012. And of course, development is growing. Furthermore, students can also take advantage of slim version of Microsoft Excel for computational physics, but a student who has no access to the laptop can also build is PowerPoint development to make presentation. So this is the kind of thing I am really interested in. So my thinking is that if with a hundred phone, the student of today and anybody for that matter now who has access to smartphone can be engaged in computational activities anywhere, anyhow, and anytime. Today I want to make a bold statement that with the Increasing global distribution of smartphone and its continuous advancing technology, the capabilities and the potential, fulfilling the new global development goal on education can be achieved 
if we properly advance our smartphones. Dear, for I am excited to consider this my presentation more as a preliminary report of what the smartphone, how the smartphone is going to contribute to achieving the global developmental goal on education. Now, in talking, let me move back to com um, computational uh, science and engineering using the QPython. Now, since involving QPython for my teaching, by the way, the way I involve it is that I am not saying, oh, if you don't, you must come to the workshop or class with QPython. If you have your normal laptop, please come. The good news is that if, as we are going on, you can use your laptop, you can also use your Android phone. And one good thing is that we have what we call the uh, Android uh, Illuminator, which of course you can also install your QPython even on your lap laptop. So you can use them. So anybody who comes, whatever computer device you want to use, you can use. But if we say we are training people on a learner, a beginner, for instance, what are the basic things you want them to know? Is the basic syntax of Python, the loop statement, the functions, data structures, classes, and of course, for science and engineering, we use them to solve general algorithm, and then we try to model a problem. So that, as I said, I want my students to understand that computation is not the solver of the problem. You should know the problem you want to solve. And of course, computation is a means for solving the problem. So I want to go straight, please, to modeling. I don't know how many people have teachers here or are in the academy. You are in the academy. OK, good. So uh, please, for those of you who are not there, don't mind me. And don't let me, sorry for boring you with this kind of thing. But there's a problem that we, uh, we want to show here to demonstrate how to use the QPython as a computer device you can use anywhere, anytime, and anyhow. So uh, in doing that, I'm going to do two things. First, by modeling a problem that I dot many of these tools. I'm talking about what are the tools? The various Python statements, the syntax, and all that. I will take a single problem to demonstrate them. Then I will try to implement the Rujakuta uh, fourth order. Of course, it's a, it's, it's a method okay, for solving differential equation. So we have the first order, second order, and third order, and of course, and their problem. But the fourth order is what we normally use. We can use it for, first, for to solve first order differential equation and second order differential equation. So I will try to demonstrate these two and use them to illustrate that the QPython in Android, Android phone can be used as a computer lab anywhere, anytime, anyhow. OK, so there's a particular problem in physics which have not been solved. It was proposed by, by a man called Skrondiga. He's a Nobel laureate. Uh, in the heat of quantum debate on measurement, he was so infuriated with what we call the Copenhagen uh, uh, interpretation of quantum mechanics that he came out with this experiment. And this experiment has remained unsolved. Though people claim they have solved it, but people believe it has remained unsolved. So though today Skrondiga is dead, but this cat, which we call the Skrindiga cat, people are still wondering if the cat is dead or alive. So what is the problem? Skrindiga said that what you see there is a, round, is a radioactive process. And if it happens that the process occurs, then that, that stuff there will drop to hit that vial of poison. And if that vial of poison is exposed, it will kill the cat, OK? Now, the, random, random pro, the, the nuclear decay is a random process. Nobody can predict when it will happen. So that guy you are seeing there, the cat, is looking at the whole process. But what he doesn't know is when the process will occur and when it is going to kill it. I remind you that the whole thing is in a bus. Okay, So you cannot see it. Where this comes from was that you cannot predict uh, quantum mechanics until you are able to observe what is happening. But physics is something that is predictable. So people want to do what? Predict it. But Skronika used this to ridicule that you cannot predict uh, such a system that is microscopic. Okay? So this was the whole idea. So that poor guy is just waiting 
for the radioactive process to occur and to know if the amount of virus that will be released will be enough to kill it or not. Okay? Now, we want to model that problem. And in modeling, with their basic step, you have what we call the problem conceptualization, the problem formation, the numerical implementation, program design and code, the computation, then you have to validate your model. If we go by that step, what we did here is that we take out the radioactive part and said, well, that is not predictable. So we leave that out. And we take the part which is predictable. First, the detection of the radioactive material. And then, which will cause the hammering of the vi, And then the killing of the cat. All these are predictable. So this is the part we are going to model. What we are doing is trying to conceptualize the problem in a mathematical form. Now, in physics, we are interested in boundary condition, the beginning and the end. Of course, we believe the, the world has a beginning, and therefore there must be what an end. And this is what we have to call boundary condition. The truth of the matter is that as a physicist, if you tell me what happened in the beginning, and you tell me what happened at the end, I can predict what happened in between. That is the situation. So the moment we are sure that this is a boundary condition, the life, our life state and the death state, then we can carry on. As the amount of those is increased from zero, the alive state of the cat will begin to do what? Decrease with increase in time. And this depends on the mass. Though the three parameters to determine the cat actual state, whether it is alive or not, will be what? The amount of the dose of the poison vi, the mass of the cat, and the time duration of uh, exposure. We are still conceptualizing. Now, having gotten these three parameters, what we now look, we look at what can we take in the cat to model for these three parameters? And we saw that the heart of the cat. Heart is important to every animal, isn't it? Okay, so the heart is a muscular pump that with each heartbeat pumps blood around the body. Central to this process is that heat rate is the heat rate because there is because there is a function of the heart called cardiac output, which is directly related to the heart rate and stroke volume, which is the amount of blood pumped out of uh, inch uh, beat. This means the, rate, the heart rate is controlled by what? The amount of blood flowing through the heart. The general consensus is that we can tell a lot about the heart through its heart rate, which is the number of times the heart beats in the space of a minute. For a cat, in the literature, we see that it beats between 140 to 220 beats per, per minute. Now, what is the implication for this? The implication is that effect of varying the amount of poison vial with time is equivalent to the heart rate of cat depending on its uh, mass. This is an assumption we make in physics, okay, when we model problem. The heart rate can directly be measured by Okay, I think I've gone. To, okay, yeah. The heart rate can directly be measured by the pulse. When we touch our heart, what do we feel? Isn't it? We feel a vibration. And that is more or less what we call a to and fro motion. A to and fro motion. And that to and fro motion is what we know as the simple harmonic air motion. It's a simple harmonic air motion. And the good thing here is that in physics, what we do is that when you have a complicated problem, you cannot solve it. You look for a simpler problem to represent that problem. And if that problem gives good result, that becomes uh, the model, and you accept it. But if the result from your model is wrong, then you can no longer use that as what? As a good model. So the simple harmonic motion in general is of great importance in physics because most complicated problems can be modeled as simple harmonic motion as we are doing here. So we are saying the cat heart can be conceptualized as what is simple harmonic motion. Okay, so 
what we there, this is uh, a simple harmonic uh, motion system. We call it uh, the simple mass spring system. Of course, when you have a spring and you release it, it oscillates up and down to and from movement like what? The pulse of your heart. And this is what we now model. I'm going to skip the mathematics, how we generate all the mathematics. But one thing that came out is that we can represent that movement, that motion, by that equation there. And that equation is a second-order differential equation. And now, a second-order differential equation, there are various ways to solve it. The good thing here is that this one has what we call constant coefficient. And when you have the one that has constant coefficient, is that you can use what we call the auxiliary method. The auxiliary method of solving second order differential equation with constant coefficient, the homogeneous type, is that you reduce the problem to just solving a quadratic equation. So you can see, I, what I'm doing now, I'm talking about physics. I've not gone to what? Computation. All I'm still talking about is physics. Now, with that, you can see the parameters we now had, mass, mass of the cat, which is equivalent to this, proportional to the size. You have B, which is the amount of pressing. Then K is the pumping of the blood. K is the restoring uh, constant, which, of course, becomes the normal flow of the blood. So with that, having done that, uh, these are, of course, the possible two solutions. Now, what we show here is that if you solve that solution, there's what we call the B squared minus 4 uh, km test. That test shows that if it's less than zero, that is going to be, in that case, the poison, as you can see, the difference between the poison and the product of four times the, the, the uh, four km is less than zero. That means we have on that dosing. The other one is when the IQOP have critical dosing, and the last one is when it is overdosing, which we kill the cat. So having got this physics clearly, uh, which I explained here also, how do we numerically solve this problem to determine the actual state? So we now go to QPython. You do not need a supercomputer. You don't need even a laptop. With your Android phone, with QPython, then you can solve the problem. So one thing is that there's so much difference between what we have in QPython and the Python itself. Uh, the first thing is we know that this is a quadratic equation. Now, creating quadratic equation in Python, you can use, uh, you just import from model poly 1D function. It's a polynomial, gives you any polynomial. But we can't do that with QPython because the only model we have there for mathematics is the math model. So what do we do? Good news is that we have what we call the, lam uh, the lambda function, which is an arbitrary function you can create. It's not like your Python function, but you can always replace it with what? Your Python functions. <coughs> now, one thing we saw is that write this code straight away with your uh, quadratic equation. You can solve the problem. But we have a problem here. This underdosing uh, case, the underdose case, is going to give us what? A complex number and math cannot give you complex number. Yes, there is complex uh, function, which of course comes with math. But if you use that, you won't get the correct uh, 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 codes. Okay? So what do we do? There is good news is that we have CMAT as a model. CMAT is a complex model, which of course actually came from uh, uh, it's, it came from mathematics and uh, uh, it came from what we call the a uh, complex, ma oh, sorry, it came from, it's, it's a complex mass model and it came directly from mathematics. So what we can do is to import it. But now if you say import all, as we normally do, it means it's going to convert both the real and the complex part of the solution into what? Into complex part. So one way to do it, we are now assuming we are teaching our students how to use your QPython. One way to do it is to import C mass alone. Just import CMAS. Then you use this for the specific this case where you have it. You don't use it for the other cases. Okay. So uh, because um, uh, let me just go straight to the program. Yeah. So you can see the program here. This is a program which you can run. And when you run, you can see we started a uh, quadratic equation using the three parameters, and which of course is the mass of the of the cat the value of a poison, and then the uh, restoring constant there, which 
we have them. Now, one thing is that initially when we started it, you can get it for inch of them. But we wanted to show how to use the for loop. So you can see the for loop has been used there. And you will see every other program goes on the way you can program everything. We have the three cases there. And when you do that, this is what you are going to get, that at m equals to 4 kg, b equals to 4 ml, k is equals to 140 uh, bits per minute, the time is there. This is on that dosing. When you go again, you increase, of course, the, the portion of the, the value of uh, the poison portion. What you get is that you have overdosing. But look at the time. It means that as you increase the time, the cat is exposed to what? More poison, which can kill it, which is the overdosing state. Now, one thing we observe here is that if you look at it, we couldn't really get a uh, float number by using uh, four. Well, in uh, Python, you can use NumPy, right? Then you import a range, okay, for your float interval. But it's not in math. So what do we do? We say, okay, we use uh, the Y, uh, the while loop. And the while loop, you can now use what? Your range. And with that range, you can get whatever you want to get. Okay. I suppose, so this is the while loop, almost the same thing, but you can observe. We have used the for loop, and we have also used the while loop. And here, we now explain to students that in your math, in your, sorry, in your QPython, if you want interval, you can easily use the while loop. So the while loop has an advantage in QPython Okay, more than the for loop. Okay, then another thing is that I just quickly say, let me go through the range cutter. Uh, this is the whole stuff. But why I brought this is that you can see their entries. S is equal to this, Y is equal to this. When you run this program, it asks you what is your S, what is your Y. Why I brought this is that I wanted to show that even with this QPython, you can begin to prepare what we call illustrative uh, uh, application. An illustrative application is an application where you just put in, you want to calculate maybe whatever, you just put in your figures, and at the end of the day, you run, it will give you uh, your answer. So this is why I decided to bring it in. Though we might not be able to complete it, but you can see that with this, you can calculate what we call the first order differential equation using the Rojkuta formula. You can also go ahead for the second order differential equation using the Rojkuta method. The beauty of it, of this one is we are saying you can use this to, cons to prepare, uh, I mean, to develop an application, an illustrative application in your Android phone. So when you carry your Android phone, because this one, we're able to show this. I have a, 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 a code here, this code we are seeing. If you tell me the half-life of any material, any element, immediately if I punch it, it gives you the result you want, what the half-life should be. If you tell me the initial value and you tell me the half-life, I will tell you what the half-life material will be immediately. It's so as simple as that. So. What we have done here, ah, okay, uh, I won't go more than that, but let me just say generally, QPython in Android phone is a blast. It's a blast. And with it, we are thinking that we can reach those who are highly, highly underrepresented. Underrepresented here could be those who are not privileged enough, whose Ecom have very tiny. That this sweetness, which we call programming, they only hear it. But now, with Android phone, most people cannot access programming. The beauty of what we are doing is that Android phone are possessed by who? By the individual. And QPython can be stored in so many versions. So with QPython, programming, can be taken to any level, anytime, anywhere, and anyhow. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. Ooh, thank you so much for that. Uh, we have time for one question. Does anyone have a question?
Thanks. Hi. Um, so I know like a lot of people are trying to obviously bring like, you know, software development to the masses and all that and to like, you know, obviously, you know, poorer parts of the world and all that. Um, how have, have you had many interactions with people like behind, for instance, Raspberry Pi and those sorts of projects? Because I think they're also trying to solve this problem of, of getting, you know, cheap computers to school kids and stuff. Um, what is their sort of like reaction? Because often these people are kind of defensive. You know, I remember there was a one laptop per child project yeah. that never went anywhere, and then and then there's Raspberry Pi. I mean, because to me this looks like it solves that problem where everyone's got a computer now. Yes. Um, have you had interactions with those kind of organizations and stuff? And are, are they receptive to people just using a cell phone instead of getting a Raspberry Pi or, or, or one of those things? Oh, um, first, let me say this. The one laptop I shared in my talk in the U.S., I too, I made sure why it fit yeah. because it was government dependent. So at the end of the day, when the laptops it got broken, maintenance problem was very difficult to resolve. Yeah, it was a terrible so project, that was that, one of yeah, the things yeah. that failed. But like I mentioned in my conclusion, the Android phone belongs to the individual. We're already maintaining our phones, isn't it? If you guys spoil today, you don't go to government to repair it for you, right? So the Android phone is your property, and you will maintain it. And once you have your Qpyter, it means you can continue the program. So the problem the one laptop I shall suffer will not occur with the Android phone. Then uh, I did not make sure here that one of the limitations of the QPython now is that we don't have a stable NumPy. Because yeah, if yeah. you want to talk about science and engineering, you must have NumPy. Then also Matplotlib. This is what the developers are working on now. Okay, so a lot of those problems will be solved in the future then? Yes, yes. Once you have that, it means once you have that. Because the result I have now, I couldn't display the graph. Otherwise, I'll show you a graph so that you see that as the poison increases, the time increases, or as the time increases, the poison increases. Then I'll also show another graph using matplotlib. I didn't want to do that with another software, right? Then you'll see that also, that as the mass increases, the amount of poison that is required to the kitty cat does what? Decreases. These are things we'll do with MATLAB. So we are looking forward to the day where QPython will have all the software. Actually, have feature parity with the actual mainstream Python. Okay, awesome. Thanks a lot. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, this is a fantastic project. I need to try out QPython too, and everyone. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs>